Patricia Anderson. It's uh, November 16th, 2014. Thanks very much for, for getting together and making the time. Um, so why don't we just start out, uh, you know, when and why did you start piping? Well, I started piping when I was eight years old and uh, I come from Aberdeen and uh, as a child I uh, was a Highland dancer, not competitively, but used to go to JL McKenzie in Aberdeen every Saturday. And there was three ladies pipe bands in the city at that time, Bon Accord ladies, the Aberdeen ladies and the Deeside ladies. And uh, they were looking for dancers to go and do engagements and things like that. So I started with the Bon Accord ladies as a dancer, going to different engagements. And uh, then they said, well, you're coming to all these things. Would you like to maybe learn the pipes or the drums and, and be fully integrated into the, into the band? So I thought, well, the pipes look quite good. I'll give that a go. So I was very fortunate that the tutor in the band at that time was a man called Sandy Robertson. And uh, he, he said, right, come along and, and put your fingers on the chanter, see what you think. Well, my fingers are quite small. And he said, oh, I think your fingers are too small. Maybe come back in a year. And I, I got quite upset, I think. <laughs> so he said, right, OK, OK, let's, let's give it a go. And uh, so I started uh, on the chanter with him and, and what age would you be at, I was eight at that eight, time eight years old yeah and those were the days when you had all the scales before you started any tune mm -hmm. and you went through all all the scales everything uh, and you had to be proficient in everything before you you got a tune and that was the aim so you'd have this board of, of scales and every week just go through them and when he thought you had all the basics just the way he wanted them and he was a stickler for good technique, uh, then you got a tune, and it was Terry Bus. That was the first, <laughs> first tune. So how long how long were you on the, the chanter before you actually uh, progressed to the real stuff, the to playing a tune? To playing a tune. Oh goodness. Um, oh, that time you well, I don't know. Probably maybe a couple of months, two or three uh, months, maybe. Pretty quick. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But he, as I say, his, and this was the grounding for everything really, that he was such a stickler for good technique. Everything had to be perfect. You know, near enough wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that stood me in great stead. So family, uh, did you have any connections to piping? Did your mother, father sort of push you into Highland dancing or, or piping? Or was it just kind of... No, the, the Highland that? dancing was just a hobby, something to do on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, they had no connections with piping or dancing. My brother briefly played uh, the pipes with a school band, so that was my really my first okay. introduction to that, seeing him coming home with that. Uh, but it was just really joining the band. It was just a new thing for all of us, really. Yeah, yeah. So um, Sandy Robertson, um, he, uh, he was your, your teacher for... How long? Well, um, he taught in the band there probably for about another two or three years, then he left the band, but by that time I was going to him weekly uh, as a private pupil anyway, and uh, as well as playing with the band, he encouraged me to get into the solo playing, mm -hmm. around the games initially, and then local mods and competitions and, you know, um, he didn't push me to do it. He just said, "Try it and see if it's for you," uh, and and it was great. It was mm -hmm. good. And then at at some point, uh, he did he did he push you into Peabrook or 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 not push you, but did he introduce you to Peabrook? And... When I was thirteen, he um, he knew Bob Nicol, hmm. and uh, he'd had a word with him to say, "Look, would you have a listen with a view to taking me on?" For Peabrook, which was great of him, really. I mean, it was the connection there was terrific for me, which allowed me to progress. Um, he was very unselfish in that way that he wanted me to. He wanted the best for me, and he knew that he couldn't provide any teaching in Peabrook. So he had a word with Bob Nicol, and I went along to have a, a just play for him, and the next thing I knew, it was 
So what age would you be at that point when you first got introduced to, to nickel? I would have been about 13. 13. Mm -hmm. and, and you went out to... Uh, to Ballater. At, to that, Ballater. at that time he moved into Ballater. He'd retired and moved into his house in Ballater. Uh, so from Aberdeen, my father used to drive me out. Right. Um, it wasn't every week or anything like that. It was it was just when, you know, if the competition season or when I'd had a tune and I went out to have a run over with it. There was no grey areas with him. He knew exactly what he wanted to hear. It was, right, this, and... Mm -hmm. um, but he was very good. So we'll, we'll return to, to Bob Nicholl, but, you know, Sandy Robertson, the fact that he knew enough mm. to know what he didn't know and then could as a teacher, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. put you on to a different teacher mm -hmm. to let you progress and yes. look after you rather yeah. than so. Yeah. How important, it sounds like that, uh, maybe talk about that a little bit. How important is that kind of teacher uh, relationship or teacher confidence? Well, thing? I think it's everything. I mean, I think I don't honestly know if, if I hadn't started with Sandy, um, if it had been, you know, someone who wasn't as good as him at teaching or you know I, I, I may have even given it up you know yeah. or, or not progressed as I as I did so I really owe him a lot mm -hmm. um, it could quite easily have been over very quickly if, if I hadn't been in the right hands and I think that's that's probably crucial for anyone learning the pipes or any instrument is the start that you get if you get a bad start you might just be turned off it forever you know, mm. but if you get a good start, uh, then you can make the most of it. Yeah. It seems like uh, loyalty sometimes, uh, you, you can't fault a piper for being loyal to their teacher. That's true, that's true. But there probably comes at a point where they feel that what they're getting isn't right for them, or, or the approach isn't right for them, yeah. or just the basics just aren't there. There's shortcuts and it's just not working. And why aren't they progressing? And the chances are it's probably because they're not being taught intelligently. Mm -hmm. Hmm. What, you know, as you were growing up, you were probably uh, you know, a, a normal teenager with lots of other interests. Um, you know, did piping, did you ever feel it was getting in the way of your social life as a teenager at that time? And you know, I guess uh, in an era when, I don't know, uh, there are a lot of, uh, lots of options for, mm -hmm. for a kid growing up in Aberdeen, I'm sure. Well, well, pipe, piping was my social life. Mm. Uh, you know, then, not so much uh, as today, when you were a child and you had a hobby, you had that one hobby. Whereas I think today, kids got lots of things. Mm. You know, they, they dabble in this or they dabble in that. And maybe it all gets a little bit diluted. Whereas if you had something then, it was like, well, this is your thing. And you make the best of it. You know, you didn't look around for something else. So piping very quickly became, the social life became the whole life, yeah. really. <laughs> were, were you drawn to, how much was the, the competitive side of it? Uh, you know, you mentioned that you that Sandy Robertson introduced you to competing, mm. I guess, in the junior competitions. Mm -hmm. and you know, Did you like the thrill of victory and uh, succeeding? Well, you know, I think um, it all, he didn't push me into it, but he encouraged me. And we started off at the games, and you'd get a little prize, and then you would. And it was a great way of testing yourself under pressure. But when you're young, you, you cope with it. Uh, you take you either take it in your stride or you don't. I think I don't think there's any middle ground. When you're young, you don't overthink a situation if you're that way inclined, and you get on with it. And it was great fun, because I mean, there the were there were some other girls in the band that used to compete as well, and it was just a it was a it was a fun thing. So it never became a a thing of well, should I be doing this? Or it was just something you did. Yeah. And um, what games is it this weekend? And well, the band's going, so we're playing the solos as well, playing the band, that kind of thing. And and let's go back to Bob Nickel. Um, when you started with him and Peabrook, was it geared towards you know just was it simply the music or was it the competition like you will succeed or? Oh no no uh, no. What no. was it like? like it, it, it what was, was his approach. It was just. Well, it was really just to to learn about P Rock, to study study it. Uh, 
it wasn't about the competing. You're going to learn Piva because you're going to compete. It was it was a case of, well, let's let's see what you like at this. Mm-hmm. Let's see, you know, how this goes. And I loved it. I loved it. I really I thought, oh, this is good. Right from the beginning. Right from the beginning. And and I used to because I would have maybe a lesson with, with Bob Nicole and then I'd go back to Sandy for light music. And we go through the light music with Sandy and I say, Right, I've got to play this Pebro, you know. <laughs> he said, Right, well I'll... and I played him the tune as well and he would sit and listen, he'd say, Oh well that's good, you know. <laughs> he would always get the Pebro, even if it was a light music lesson, he would always get Brilliant. that as well. Um so no, I really I really enjoyed it and and I'm glad he opened that avenue up for me. Right. And and the kinds of tunes that uh, Bob Nickel like started you with, would he how would how would how would you choose what to play? Did he go by what you liked or Oh no, or? no, no, it was it was uh, you were always led by what I mean, you know, I was guided by him. Yeah. And that was it. Uh, my first tune was McLeod of Rassi. And uh, you know, he just, uh, he had the Angus Mackay book. Well, I had no music or anything like that. Mm. So he gave it away home with me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was, I think it was an old book. And I'm not sure if that time the new publication was out. And I remember I uh, I bought a the uh, music manuscript and I wrote it out from the book. Really? <laughs> All the... <laughs> As long as a 13-year-old. Uh, Yes, right. I'd never seen it in Piro Society form, you know, yeah. all abbreviated. So I just wrote the tune out. <laughs> I guess I'm a guy. <laughs> um, so, I could, so I had to give me his book back, you see. I, um, so it was just, it was, I remember doing that. And then he, he that was the day of the Real to Real tapes, mm. and he sang the tune on the Real to Real for me, so I could take that home and, and use that, and he would. Uh, I remember him saying before he started, he would sing it. Before he started, he would say, "I know Caruso, but this is this is my interpretation of this." And, and would he be uh, really strict? I mean, hear hear stories about Nickel, you know, have to l- learn six tunes this week and kinds of no. reputation like that of being very hard on, on pupils. I, I I don't remember him being like that. I don't mm. remember, you know. Just I remember him being quite a gentleman, you know. Um, whether he he was different because it was, you know, for me, because it was, I was a girl, he mm-hmm. might have, you know, he might he might have um, been a little bit softer. I don't, I don't know, but um, yeah. it was always a case of well, you know, that's you come back with the tune, and we go over it, and now sit down talk about it. Any bits you're not sure about, do that in the chanter. Right, get the pipes out and let's. And as I say, he was he was always very, you know, no, that's that's not right. This is what it has to be. There was no grey areas. You were left in no uncertain terms what he wanted and mm-hmm. how he wanted it. Yeah. And were you conscious? Did it sink into you that, uh, uh, you know, this was one of the, the great Peabrook masters? Oh, I was very aware that I was very lucky. Yeah. Very well, fortunate is probably the right word. Very fortunate to be sitting there, getting that kind of tuition, um, and to try and make the most of it. And did you meet uh, other? He he would have been teaching other prominent pipers at the time as well. Did you, did you get introduced to them and see them around the games more? And did you have that commonality as being an, a, a pupil of Nichols? Um. Well, I didn't. I was trying to think. Well, with playing in the juniors up until that point, I knew a lot of the pipers before then. Anyway, you know, um, you knew that you knew who his other pupils were. But uh, I suppose with me being thirteen, there was maybe a little bit of an age difference, so it wasn't a case of uh, yeah. being together all the time. So, what about your other uh, major inspirations? There must have been a point where. Uh, you were going to Nickel, you were progressing better and better, more into Peabrook. Were you inspired by other, uh, some of the, the senior solo pipers mm. at, of the time? Mm. Like who really uh, inspired you? It, well, I mean, when you're young like that, you are, it was great to go to the competitions and just look at all these great players and be real, you know, look at them and go, oh, wouldn't it be great to be like that? Wouldn't it be great to be doing that? I remember going to Sky. Uh, one year and listening to Ian McFadden 
and I had I had an autograph book and I asked him for his autograph. <laughs> and I still got it in my little autograph book. So you kind of looked at them as, you know, oh, isn't this great, you know. Um, I remember at the Maud at Ayr one year, uh, the winners of the competitions had to turn up at night for a concert that was um, televised at that time. Mm. Uh, so I had won one of the junior sections. Uh, this was 1974, and went along to the, it was the big it was the town hall in Ayr, which is a huge place. And we had to wait backstage, and backstage was uh, Hugh McCallum, and he was waiting to go on to play his March to Spain Real. And uh, I remember standing watching when he's walking up and down, just getting preparing himself, and and he went on and played his winning. March just being real, and I just thought, wow, this is great. You know, this is just to just to be, you know, uh, surrounded by that kind of thing is inspiring. Yeah. And what about some of the uh, the pipers who you'd hear and you'd hear their interpretations of Peter? Would you ever discuss that with Nickel? Uh, oh talk no. about <laughs> he's, he he didn't want want oh, to no. even talk about that. Well, no, no, I wouldn't have discussed other people's interpretations with Bob Nickel. It was. Bob Nichols' interpretation that was the most important thing. I mean, if, when you're a pupil and you're that age, yeah. you don't question what you're, you, know, you don't, you're not looking for. And you probably don't have the knowledge to be sitting and listening and, and, and making that valuation. You can, you can see what they're doing, but your tutor is your tutor and you're, you, know, you, you, you take most of it from... From him. Well, I did at that time because I was quite young. But yeah. as you get older, you 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 know you, you start to have your own opinions. Sure. But when you're that age, there was only one opinion that mattered, and that was his. <laughs>